Now, the the few days before that, I saw Sinister. Okay, Sinister, I hated. Now I'm seeing it in a whole different light. The reason this, I don't even know where to start. What is up with these movies with the dumb fucking white people in it? Man, this is not a good week for white people. The, the white people in these movies is fucking stupid. We have the white family in Paranormal Activity 4 who are just like fingers in their ears. La, 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 ghost, yeah, sure, whatever, la, la, la. And then we have the guys in Sinister. This will actually probably be it. Yeah. No, you know what? The movie is so fucking predictable. This isn't even spoilers. The family in... The whole story in Sinister is that it's about a true crime novelist, played by Ethan Hawke, I believe. He writes true crime novels, but he hasn't written a good one in ten years. He used to be a really good true crime writer, and he's, he's looking for his big break again. Okay, so it's actually an interesting character we've developed here, and character is not the problem. It's well acted, and the characters are unlikable, but still kind of compelling, you know, because the guy, Ethan Hawke's character is no longer, he doesn't really care about the people as much as he used to. He's, he's really just in it for the money, but, okay, are we going to... He, he's in it for the money now. He's really trying to find his big break, and he'll kind of step on anyone to get it. Not exactly the most likable character traits, and yet there's there's still something in him that that cares. You know what I mean? Um, so, or uh, you are killing my horror movie vibe. She sulks. Okay, so what happens is he's he's uh he has moved the family from their old house to this new house because there's the case of a multiple homicide. But the, the weirdness is the entire family got killed except for one of the children, okay? So he's investigating this because he thinks there's a story in it, and there is. So he's not welcome in the town because it, they think it's really distasteful that he's coming and kind of investigating a case that they widely regard as closed. They've basically written off the kid as being dead. So he's like, I don't believe that. I believe the kid is here to be found somewhere. And so they're like, yeah, whatever. But here's the funky thing. Right away, this movie makes no sense. Because not only has he moved to the town where the disappearance happened, which he didn't have to do. There's no way you can explain to me he had to move to that town. But not only has he done that, he has moved into the exact same house as the murdered family. Exact same house. Completely unnecessary. And you're like, well, no, he wanted to he wanted to do full diligence to investigate this homicide. He's he really wants to solve it, so he's he has to go into this house. Okay. He has to go into the house. That doesn't mean he has to fucking buy it. There's nobody living in the house until he buys it. So why can't he just why does he have to relocate the whole fucking family? Because, like, I can see him not wanting to be apart a from his family because he's got kids. His wife is his wife is a fucking harpy who's like, you need to spend more time with the kids. But it's clear he doesn't really care about that because he's not a very likable character. Um, but there's no reason, there's no fucking reason why he couldn't say, you know what, I'm going to take a week Go to that town, get a hotel room, and I'm going to investigate this on my own. Okay? There's no reason why he couldn't do that. The house is empty. He could just go to the house, look around, get all the answers he needs to. Because really, what's he going to find in that fucking house? You know, what could possibly be there that he needs to live in that house to find? Like... And I know it would be trespassing, maybe. Like, the house is still for sale in my scenario. But he could go around there and he could snoop around. He could break into that house if he really... There's nobody there. Right? There's nobody in that house. He could poke around the backyard. You know, I would really... It's been years since the disappearance. I should have put her... My identity disc. 
it's been years since the murder happened, so I doubt the cops are going to come swinging around any time to chase him off. In fact, the cops seem pretty clear that they would stay away from this place because they're kind of spooked by it. Even worst case scenario, he could go to maybe the real estate agent and say, like, look, I'm a novelist. I'm a true crime uh, biographer or whatever like that. And it would really mean a lot to, like, ask permission to poke around the house. They would probably let him. Or he could be like, um, and this wouldn't exactly give him a lot of time, but, like, could I maybe, like, he could lie and say, like, could I get a walkthrough of the house and inspect it and see if he can find anything weird about the house during his walkthrough. And if nothing else, like, you know what I mean? He doesn't need to move in the house. Why would he ever want to do that? I, I don't understand. And he's like, well, he's like, well, no, it makes sense for me to move in the house because when I write my book, it'll be my big break. I'll have all the money I ever wanted. And I'm like, it's, you don't, you don't need to move in the house, bro. Get a hotel, go there, snoop around. A week later, you should have all the answers you fucking need. Because not only is it, not only is it unlikely that he'll find the answers he's looking for walking around an empty house, but he probably won't. And so he does, but only because there's something supernatural involved. You know, um, it's like, I just it right away I didn't identify with this movie because I'm like, there's no reason. He, Okay, I'm repeating myself. But, like, okay, so he, he's looking around the house, and spooky shit starts to happen right away, and he, sh he hears shit in the attic, and, of course, when he hears shit in the attic, it's a jump scare. It's like this, it's like an anvil fucking hitting the fucking roof, you know, or the attic. And he like he's like, oh, shit, I gotta investigate. And he goes up there, and he finds this big fuck-off scorpion there, and he kills it, and he, he sees it's right next to this box of Super 8 film. And the Super 8 film is is labeled these really creepy titles. And the, basically the first half of the movie is him opening these Super 8 films and watching them. And sure enough, this is, this is the legit creepy stuff. Is he watches the films and they're all of different multiple serial murders of these families getting killed off in horrible, gruesome, awful disgusting ways like one family gets set on fucking fire another family gets hung or hanged like that's that's always that's it's always been weird to me that the actual words when you're hung on a noose it's hanged or whatever um this entire family gets hanged uh another family gets fucking taped to chaise lounges and drowned in a pool and you're like oh my god this is fucking horrifying and that's the scary part of this movie. Why is it scary? Because it sets an atmosphere. It sets a tone of dread. And what's really scary about it is that, aside from the musical score, which I actually thought did detract from the fright of it, but I'll get to that, it takes place in silence. You don't hear a thing from these films. These acts of horrible violence are taking place with no sound. The only sound you hear is the rattling of the projector. That is so fucking spooky that you don't hear what's going on in these murders. It's so much scarier than if you actually heard what was happening. It's hard to explain why, but it's unsettling. The fact that you are a distant observer... It, it distances you from this film, and yet you're watching these awful things happen. You're imagining... That's where horror lies, is the imagination... Uh, it, 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 you know how people often say, show, don't tell? You're being shown these things, but there's a lot that's unseen, that's left to the imagination. The horrible smell, the fear, the sound of what's going on in these houses that you're denied, that you're imagining. That's the scary part of this movie, and that's the part that's done masterfully well. Absolutely masterfully done. That's the great part of this movie. And then they fuck it up. How do they fuck it up? It's because weird shit starts happening to Ethan Hawke. And all of that weird shit is nothing but obscenely loud jump scares. All of it, and it pisses me off. Because, like, he'll be walking around, he hears shit in the attic, and sure enough, 
The reason he goes to investigate the attic is because he hears this gigantic fucking thundering crash, like, right over his head. It scares the shit out of you. No, it doesn't scare you. It startles the shit out of you. And, like, right away I'm like, oh, this is how we're going to play it, right? So he goes into the attic, he sees the box, and then the attic door fucking slams shut with the force of the, of the moon crashing into the planet. Loudest fucking thing ever. And, like, this happens all the fucking time. He's looking around the house. Something, a shadow, like, darts out in front of me. He's like, oh, my God! And, of course, the shadow darting out in front of him is accompanied by this cataclysmic fucking orchestra sting. I hate orchestra string jump scares. They're not fair. They're artificial. They are lame. You know, the loud noises, like maybe the crashing in the attic, that sucks too, but at least it's a noise that would occur in the house. You can buy it happening. Not really, but you could see, you could, if there was a crash in the attic, okay. But to artificially amp up the scare with an orchestra sting is awful. It's not fair. That is... And, you know, there's so many scares in this movie. They would have been so much scarier. They would have been terrifying. Terrifying if there were no orchestra stings and it took place in silence. There's this, probably the biggest scare in the movie is Ethan Hawke is looking around. He's looking in the yard. And all of a sudden, at warp two... This fucking spooky child's head comes racing out of the darkness and is like right here and he doesn't see it. And it's like it's like breathing on his face. It's like right here. And of course, when that happens, orchestra sting! Like the loudest orchestra sting ever. And I'm like, ah! Oh, God damn it! That would have been a million times scarier had it taken place dead silence if this face had come rushing out of the darkness and you didn't hear it you didn't fucking hear anything because ethan hawk doesn't hear anything it helps you identify with the character if you hear what he hears do you understand if you cut the soundtrack out so much scary why because you're not startling the audience when the face comes rushing out of the darkness. Stealthily quiet. Maybe all you hear is the sound of rushing air that's being displaced by this ghost. Whatever. If that's all you hear, that is terror. That is... That builds an atmosphere. An orchestra sting builds an atmosphere, all right. It builds the atmosphere of annoyance, and it builds the atmosphere of you being afraid of the next loud noise. I can't harp on this enough, because it is weak directing, it's weak storytelling, and it's not necessary to scare people. If anything, it hinders the scares. Now, a couple times is fine, and a couple of times the jump scares are really, really good. But, as evidenced by the Super 8 film, it's so much better when the experience is unconventional, when it's strange, and it's weird, and it's... it's real. You know? Like, you're watching this family get hanged, and you're like, oh my god. What? Oh my god. It's not like... If all of a sudden, like, a fucking buzzsaw blade cut the branch and hang these people, but it was accompanied by, like, these this really intense violin section doing, like, this tremolo, you'd have been like, oh, that, it, it tells us how to feel. I hate that. I hate when an orchestra tells us how to feel about a scene. It's manipulative. It's terrible. I really hope I'm getting through to you when it comes to the, the nature of cinema. I don't like being manipulated. I don't like being told how to feel. Movies, it should be up to you how you feel about a movie, and it should be good enough that you shouldn't have to be told how to feel. Music is fine. 
Accompanying music is good. And in fact, at the last act, the music is beautiful. It's not pretty in the sense that it's it's nice to listen to, but it's nice in the fact that it's strange and unsettling. It's good because it creates the atmosphere. It's hard to explain unless you've seen the unless you've seen this part of the movie, but there comes a time when Ethan Hawke is like, fuck it, this is weird, I'm gonna burn the film. There's this really strange and unsettling sound. It's 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 unlike most music you've ever heard. It's not a string section, it's not like a band, it's not an orchestra. It's like this strange, weird, discordant and I guess it does tell you how to feel a little bit, but it's weird. You're, you're like listening and you're, you're, you're on edge because this is not the, the sort of thing you normally hear. You know what I mean? It's the sort of thing, I, I guess the best thing I could explain it as is if you ever saw There Will Be Blood and there's that scene when the, uh, when the oil rig, the, 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 yeah, the oil thing catches on fire, there's like this weird kind of percussion-y, sound music that that drowns out what's actually happening and all you're hearing is this music and and you're not hearing you're kind of hearing off in the distance like screaming and you're just watching uh daniel plainview just kind of process what's going on from afar and he's this music is like very strange um it's a lot like the music in the movie in uh uh insidious uh oh what's the movie um yeah, Insidious, where the, a lot of the music is very unconventional. And there are jump scares in Insidious, but they're earned. In fact, a lot of the scariest things in Insidious are watching that weird fucking ghost dancing through a uh, tiptoe through the tulips, I think, is actually watching it do a very happy dance. I don't remember that many orchestra stings or jump scares in that movie. I'm sure there are, but the fact that I remember more than anything else is the spooky imagery, that's where the scares come from, because that's fucking scary, is watching a ghost, like, not dancing around, but not in a funny way, where it's it hard. To, it's really spooky. So, the manipulative jump scares are the weakest part of that film, and it didn't need to be that way. It did so well with the Super 8 film, and the last act is where it really gets effective, because... As Ethan Hawke starts slipping more and more into, like, an unhinged state, the way he sees the world is like the Super 8 films. Like, he's he's freaking out, and all of a sudden it's like the, the film is edited, and the film starts to shake, and is really jarringly cut. The editing is, is almost genius, the way it's cut, where it's the film is rattling like Super 8 in a projector, and he's like, he's seeing things kind of grainy, and it's weird, and it, like I said, it's unsettling, it builds an atmosphere, it's not scaring you with loud noises, that's why it's done so well. So, it flirts with greatness so many times, and that orchestra's thing! You know, it's, it's not, it's too much, it's too much, and I, uh, and I, it suffers from dumb white people syndrome, where, again, this is not found footage, but there comes a point in this movie where he is seeing evidence of murders. He has basically cracked the case, proven that the girl he's looking for is alive. And not only that, the cases are connected to several more, multiple murders stretching back to the 60s. He has direct evidence of this. Does he call the cops? No. He, he considers it, and then he puts the phone down, and there is no reason for him to do that. They justify it by, like, you can kind of read in his character voice, like, he's like, if I do this, it jeopardizes my book. He's like, I, I, I won't be able to write my book if I give this to the cops. And I'm like, no, I don't buy it. Like, Or he's like, maybe the cops won't believe I, I don't know what he's thinking. Like, I guess he's thinking, like, I won't be able to write my book or my book will suffer because of this. But why? He's... If he shows this evidence to the cops, and it's concrete, indisputable evidence that these cases are connected, the kid is probably alive, and the fact he could solve upwards of, like, 12 other murders, and it, and not, it would not only not harm his book, it would help immensely for his book, because if he shows the cops his evidence, 
and the cops don't the cops don't initially believe him if he shows them this evidence they will help him they would probably keep him in the loop because he was such a monumental aid to the investigation of these of these murders now i i really think that like maybe he doesn't know but in the context of the movie he's not given any reason like okay fred williamson the the sheriff in the in the town doesn't like him but the thing is if it's proven he's onto something he's he's actually shown fred williamson doesn't like ethan hawk but it's very clear from his behavior the reason he doesn't like ethan hawk is because he considers ethan to be kind of a vulture um uh desecrating the memories of this family kind of like uh he sees him as uh making stuff up as being like a hack writer who's who's creating controversy where there is none and he cares enough about the family he wants their spirits to rest but when ethan hawk comes up with this definite evidence he has no reason to doubt that fred williamson would then cooperate with them because he says you know he says like if there was a shred of evidence that this family was actually murdered and if there was a chance this girl was alive I would look into it, but there's not. This kid is dead. But if he showed them evidence, he'd be like, God damn, sir, you are right. You were right this whole time. The sheriff's department would be at his disposal. I really believe that. You know, because he helped crack this case. And I'm like, the dumb white person example number one. Two, moving into the house. Hang on. <laughs> Oreo is losing her goddamn mind. Then... When weird shit starts to happen, indisputably weird shit, even if you were the kind who didn't believe in ghosts or demons or paranormal shit, example, he starts waking up in the middle of the night, he hears a noise, okay, and he, uh, he investigates the noise and he hears the sound of his projector. Someone turned the projector on, okay? So he goes downstairs and he sees the projectors on and it's showing the film. And he's like, what the fuck? So he goes over there and he turns the projector off. Now, he's like, and now maybe you think, well, the kids have always shown an interest in his, in his work, but they're not old enough to process it because what he deals in is horrific stuff. And I'm like, at first you might believe it, but then you think. And like, there's no way a kid knows how to set up a super eight projector there's just no i mean i doubt the kid would even know what a super eight is you know the kid doesn't even know what a fucking vhs tape is but i'm like okay well maybe he thinks the kid turned it on so he leaves the he leaves his office and he locks it he goes back to bed and then like 10 minutes later he hears the projector again and he's like what in the fuck so he gets up he unlocks his office and the fucking super eight's running again now you might have chalked up the first incident to their to the kid okay fine because the kid has been shown to get up and kind of sleepwalk. Fine. But he's locked the office. He's turned it off. He's probably fucking unplugged it. You know. So, like, the second time around, it's either a ghost or there's someone in the fucking house. I think he chalks it up to someone being in the house. But does he call the cops? Nope. At some point, when he's, co he's, he's coming completely unhinged, he calls one of the deputies. And he's like... He's like, do you believe in ghosts? Because cause I, I, I don't know anymore. And he's like, he's, he's like, I, there's, I, I get the feeling something is in my house. I'm like, no, something is definitely in your fucking house. You know? And, and I'm like, I don't buy this. Guy. And so the, the deputy is like, look, you've moved into a multiple murderer's house. Or you're, you, moved, you moved into a house where lots of murders occurred. You're probably stressed. Everyone would see demons if you were moving into a into a murderer's house. It's this case is getting in your head, and I'm like, of course, of course, it's chalked up to stress, no sleep, alcoholism. There's like a litany of excuses. Of course, nobody believes it's ghosts when he's clearly seen them several times, and so he he doesn't he doesn't, and this is actually a case where. You would set up a camera, because this happens, like, every night. It's turning on the fucking projector, and, like, there's no explanation for it. Like, he's, he's got the office locked, and the projector keeps coming on. He actually is shown to have a DV cam. Set up the DV cam and see who's turning on your fucking projector. Like, I've just made the... Sinister makes a better paranormal activity if the guy had any brains at all. 
Um, um, and what's uh, what really made me mad? Like, okay, maybe. I'm the only guy that is bothered by the jump scares. Now, granted, the jump scares are really well done. Like, they are, in terms of as, as good as jump scares can get, they're well done. You know, it's, they're okay. You know, if you're in it for jump scares, this will actually do it, because it's, it's good enough with the atmosphere of dread, the contrast, I could see it working, it didn't work for me. But I definitely see the genius in this movie. For me, though, only half the movie is genius, and that's the half that has the Super 8 stuff, because, in a way, that's the stuff that feels the most real. The Super 8 stuff, you could see, you could see this maybe happening, you know? Like, the, the ghost is all grainy, you can't see it, it's unsettling, it's, it's dead, you can see it. Where it's artificial is the orchestra sings, the, the clear, the predictable ghost jumping out, the fact they kind of, they, they really overplay the spooky children aspect. And I was saying this is going to be a spoiler, but it's not. It's like, it's the big reveal of the movie, but it's so not, it's, anyone would get this. And anyone would get it within like the first quarter of the movie. You get this. In fact, this is where I really got annoyed with this movie, Beyond the Jump Scares, was that how does this guy, who is a true crime novelist or a true crime bio I don't even know what you call it, true crime biographer or whatever like that. How does he not figure this out? Because he's he's like, okay, he moves into this house where many murders occurred and the only person the, the only strange thing is that the child disappears. Okay? And so he starts watching these films and they're all of murders where the entire family gets killed but the child is missing. And then he see, he starts to see this same ghost appearing in the, in the films. Or, but he doesn't think it's a ghost. He thinks it's a guy. He thinks it's the same guy. But that's, like, even the deputy is like, look, if, if this guy was in all these films and these murders go back to the 60s, this guy would be, like, 85 years old by now. And that's even a stretch, depending on how old he started this. And he's like, so either we've got, like, an 85-year-old guy who is somehow overpowering or drugging and, and hanging this family, which is uh, highly unlikely. Or, what's the only other explanation? The kid did it. And it, I'm, not str like, I'm not saying I'm super smart or something. I'm saying, like, this is simple deductive reasoning. Like, either it's this guy and it's unlikely, or the kid was somehow involved. And so... Even early on, I was like, the kid is somehow involved. And like, and, and what makes it clearer and clearer and clearer is that at every turn, everything that is happening to this guy, everything, almost everything that's crazy happening to this guy involves the kids. The kids start acting weird. Um, in fact, there's the perfect, is that one of the first things he sees is that he's hearing this noise and he's like, what the fuck is that? So he's walking around. And he sees, like, ghostly kids darting out. He's like, Jesus Christ, a ghostly child! And so he, uh, he, um, he sees the, one of the moving boxes. And the moving box, like, moves. And he's like, what the fuck? And the moving it moves again. He's like, what the fuck? And Jesus Christ! And so he's, like, he's approaching it real slowly. And all of a sudden, the box starts to open. And coming out of the box... Like, one of the ghosts in Deadly Premonition, he sees, like, I can't even do it. He sees, like, this. He sees this kid come out of the box, and it's like, uh, uh, and it starts to, like, it, like, the kid, like, folds out of the box, like, backwards, and starts to, like, scurry, like, it's crab walking. It's like, uh, and it, it's, like, screaming, like, Ah, uh, and it's like well, he's like Jesus Christ! What the fuck is this? And so like he 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 like it's fucking scary this thing and and I'm like okay this kid like rises out of the box walking on his hands backwards his face contorted and screaming this unearthly scream <laughs> and I'm like. How are you... He's like, oh... And they, they kind of really weakly justify it by saying the kid has night terrors. Dude, 
if these are night terrors, the, the fucking hardcore night terrors, like, I fucking, I'm damn skippy. This kid has not ever climbed in a fucking moving box and then walked, like, crab walked out of one, screaming his goddamn head off like he was possessed in the fucking exorcist. Like, Jesus. And especially since the stuff he's seeing is, like, fucking demonic, like, clearly fucking demonic. And, like, the fact he never puts two and two together to think that, you know, uh, maybe the kids bear watching because they all start acting really fucking weird. Like, even weirder than that, they start to act, like, really bizarre. Like, uh, it, it, one of the oh, just, one of the first things that happens is, like, um, the, the same boy gets in trouble because he starts drawing, like, really weird pictures. Like, really demonic fucking pictures. Like, he goes to a whiteboard and he takes a permanent marker and he draws the scene with the tree where the family gets hanged from the tree. Like, he draws it fucking perfectly, you know. And, uh, and you're like, and they're like, there's no way he could have seen that. And they're like, well, maybe he, like, walked into my office, I forgot the log. I'm like, no, no. Like, he, like, why would this kid act so fucking spooky and, like, vandalize a, a school whiteboard and draw this fucking satanic thing if there was nothing weird going on? They're, they established really early on the girl, the little girl, likes to paint on her walls. And I know you know where this is going. Um, of course, the kid starts drawing demonic shit on the walls. And there's no way that the parents don't tuck this kid in at night and see the fucking hanging tree on the wall. They don't fucking see the, the exact same, like, goddamn demon drawn and scrawled on the fucking walls. I'm like, dude, can you not figure this out? Like, the kids are acting weird. The kids are the only things that are just, like, what is the matter with you, man? Uh, he's so dumb. And the fact that he can't even suspect that there's something... It, it, he even starts to suspect it's supernatural. So, like, if he's suspecting it's supernatural and the kids are always disappearing, maybe it has something to do with the kids. The same kids, by the way, that are acting so fucking crazy. It gets better. He gets dumber. Okay? So, he uh, he's like... He starts seeing occult symbols on the Super 8 films. And, by the way, the kids are drawing the occult symbols, but, you know... So, he contacts this... Uh, this professor at the university who knows, like, occult symbols. And he's like, oh, well, he's like, I, I have definitely seen these symbols before, but they're, they're really obscure. And Ethan's like, obscure? He's like, yeah, yeah, um, th they actually come from ancient Babylonian, uh, texts, most of which have long ago been destroyed. He's like, Babylon, he's like, yeah, Babylonian. He's like, the symbols, I had to do some, look, uh, I had to do some serious research, but the symbols you found, there's, it's really bizarre. This isn't some, like, Satanist cult or some gangbangers. No, this is, like, hardcore deep devil stuff. Uh, the symbol you found is apparently the Babylonian god of, of devouring children. He says that. He's like, apparently, this, this Babylonian god is well known for taking innocent children, corrupting their souls... And then abduct, abducting him into his nether realm where he devours them whole. And Ethan Hawke is like, eating children? And he's like, yeah, eating children. And that's why, they, they say, he also said, the Babylonians also were afraid that he lived somehow in pictures of him. So if you, there was a picture of him, he, that's why they burned virtually every single symbol of him. That's why the symbol is so obscure. And Ethan's like, uh, what? And he's like, the, the professor's like, you don't have any of those symbols with you, do you? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And, uh, so, like, he's he's basically had it explained to him. And, again, this is, like, undeniably supernatural shit that's happening to him. Completely. Like, there's a, there's a poisonous fucking snake. Like, one of those, uh, like a coral snake. Like, one of those, like, red, white, and black snakes that's clearly, like, I, I forget what it's like, a cotton mouth or something like that. It's a coral snake. Like, one of the deadliest snakes known to man. And he sees this snake that is in his, in his attic, impossibly, somehow in his attic, and he, he tells the deputy this. He's like, man, I went up there, and there was this fucking snake in my ear. And he's like, 
And he's like, the deputy's like, well, well, there's no way a snake could have made that banging noise in your attic. And Ethan's like, no shit. He's like, the deputy, I, I swear to God he says this. He's like, y you know what could have made that noise? Squirrels. This crashing sound sounded like a piano exploding in his attic. Combined with the orchestra thing, yeah, it was like somebody put dynamite in a piano and blew it up in the attic. And and Ethan Huck looks a little dubious. He's like, squirrels? And the deputy's like, yeah, squirrels. Man, they make noise. And Ethan Huck's like, okay. I, I don't think it was squirrels, but okay. <laughs> he leaves it at that. Like, no, clearly there's some kind of, like, sumo match going, in, going on in your fucking attic because it's not fucking squirrels. But he seems to, like... Kind of like reluctantly just go like, Wh whatever. I I need to finish my book. So he goes on, I'm like dude. And then he gets dumber. Eventually, he's like, he sees enough spooky shit. He's seeing the guy, the the demon or whatever it is, in his yard. Okay, and he's like, you know what? Fuck it, we're leaving. So, like, I'm supposed to think, like, he's a really smart guy for finally g getting up and leaving. Like, in Insidious. In Insidious, like, really early on, they're like, look, spooky shit is happening, the kids are getting hurt, we're leaving. And I'm like, yeah, that, you know what, that's really smart. It's because, like, in so many movies, they're like, no, we're gonna stay here, we're gonna, we're, this is, it's all in our heads. No, in Insidious, they're like, you know what, spooky shit is happening, we're leaving, so they leave. I'm supposed to think, maybe, in Sinister, like, they're really smart for eventually, like, getting the message and leaving... Except, like, it's, he's, he's not smart. He goes back to his old house, which, by the way, is considerably larger, more gothic, and spookier than the suburban house they were just in. Like, oh, this is good. It's, it's like fucking Wayne Manor. I'm like, how can he afford this? He hasn't had a, he hasn't had a best-selling book in ten years. He lives in fucking Wayne Manor. So, like, he's in this fucking place, big gothic fireplace, and he, he actually... It, it further gets spelled out to him. Where, like, he's he's like, I gotta put this behind me. I'm finally out of that fucking place. That can, nothing can catch me now. Our kids are safe. And so he, he eventually, like, he calls up the, uh, he calls up the professor. And he has the shit explained to him. That, that scene I was telling you about. But, and so then the deputy who's been helping him out, the deputy who actually does like him, calls him up. And he's like, he's like, I just figured it out. He's like, Every family that was murdered lived in the house of the previously murdered family. That's the connection. So all these people who were murdered lived in the guys lived in the previous family's house. So you lived in the previous family's house and then you left. So you're you're right in the timeline. You're next. Does he get up and like arm himself? Does he even suspect the children might be involved despite the fact that he has been flat out told that the kids are somehow like being corrupted by this demon? In fact, he goes and he finds in his own attic more films of the murders that could not have possibly gotten there any other way. He finds the films and he's like, I shouldn't watch these. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Okay. So he tapes together the films. He, he fixes the films. And he starts watching the films. And in these films, he sees the endings, like the extended endings of the Super 8 films of the murders he just watched. And he watches the first one of the family getting hanged. And he sees it and he's like, oh, oh my God. So he watches past the original ending, right? And he sees climbing down from the tree, holding the saw that caused the family to get hanged. You have to see it. He sees, climbing down the tree, he sees the kid. And he sees the kid of the family who's, like, walking all robotically and walks up to the camera with, like, this axe. And the kid goes, shh. Does he get the message? No. He puts in the second film, and he sees the family getting set on fire. And then... The camera turns around, and he sees the child in the family holding a gas can and, like, a road flare. And he, the kid is like, shh. Does he get the message? No. He goes, and he watches the next film of the family getting drowned. 
And by the way, how'd the little kid manage to pull people forcibly into the pool because they weigh like 180 to 220 pounds? I don't think the kid's doing this. Anyway, so he sees the family getting drowned, and sure enough, the camera turns around, and it's the kid. And the kid goes, shh. There's like five films like that. He watches all five. Does he manage to put together not only the fact that he was just told that his family is the next to be targeted, not only is he just told that the kids are going to act spooky and something is, like, possessing them, not only that, he watches every single previous murder where the kid has turned out to be the murderer of the family. Does he put it together? Does he call the cops knowing that he's about to be targeted and maybe murdered? Instead, he suddenly, he's like, oh my god. He starts to feel really, he turns around, and it's the kid! And the kid kills him, kills everyone, and that's the movie. And sure enough, just when they, just when he thought they'd leave the movie well enough alone with a genuinely spooky long shot of the box of films in the attic, which has returned, the boogeyman swings his face into the camera, huge orchestra scare, for no reason, then they crash to credits. I'm like, you couldn't let it go. You actually had a spooky ending with no jump scares, and you had to do one more. This character, the, the author character, is perhaps, and this is saying something, even counting the Friday the 13th films, even counting the dumbest stoner characters in any horror movie, this character could very well be the dumbest. He's flat out told what's happening. He firsthand witnesses five straight cases of the kid committing the murders, the same murder that he's investigating. He's told that he's next in line. He sees no pattern. A fucking box turtle could have put that together. I put it together before the first act wrap, before any of this came to light. I was like, wow, we're seeing several cases of murder and the kid is missing. Maybe the kid's involved. The entire movie, he never even suspects. That is so irritating when you are so much smarter than the main character. So much smarter. This character, I'm amazed he can he's smart enough to eat without dying. Unbelievably stupid. So much so that I think I honestly think the director realized the mystery is so bad and it's not even a mystery, they didn't even bother. Like, they didn't even bother really trying to make it a reveal, because really early on, it's to anyone with a working frontal lobe, it is so obvious the kids are involved. Because at, like, the one-fourth point, he is continuously haunted by ghostly, spooky, fucking children. These children look like they've been drowned. They've got, like, black veins, demon eyes, and they're, like stalking him and acting all spooky, you're like, it's the kids. It's the kids. The, the, the alive kids are acting spooky as shit. It's so infuriating that this guy does not ever even suspect. It's so fucking infuriating. And it's a shame, because there's a lot to like in this movie. In fact, I kind of get... I actually understand, like, at some point where the guy knows that watching the movies is killing him. It's driving him mad. And even when he's decided to burn the films, when he gets more films, he, he knows he shouldn't, but he's compelled. He's like, I gotta know. I, I gotta see this, because I gotta know what happened. That, it's, this is not in no way connected to the Cthulhu mythos, but it's very Lovecraftian. In the sense that a lot of Lovecraftian horror, or some of it anyway, some of my favorite horror 
is the sense that there's there's a truth there's a truth out there behind this weird stuff and you don't you don't want to know it because you know that knowing that truth will either kill you or worse drive you irreparably insane it's but but you got to know you you don't you got to i love that it's a puzzle that needs finishing even if it kills you you got to know you know i love that i even as i was really getting mad at this guy for watching the movies when he should have been running for his life i understood that i love that kind of horror and so i was like i was really struggling with myself where i was like i love this i love this horror atmosphere that they're setting up because he's like the movies are genuinely disturbing him and he shouldn't keep watching but he has to you know i was like i love it but it's it's not that sort of puzzle that needs solving because the puzzle solved you know it's it's obvious to anyone who even watches half this movie what's going on so it's not it's not that kind of puzzle that if you don't watch the films it drives you mad it's the kind of puzzle that anyone could figure out it's one of those 30 piece puzzles you buy at the dollar store you buy at the dollar store it's it's a worthy plot device and one i really enjoy for a mystery much better than this and so like i said this i wanted to love this movie so much but the script I don't know if it's the script that lets it down. It does partially because the mystery is not that good, or at least it's not developed as well. It needed rewrites. This movie needed a lot of rewrites. But I think what let me down the most is the directing, because it's the director ultimately who put those jump scares in the movie when it didn't need them. It it didn't need the orchestra stings. Those are manipulative. They're overmuch, and it ruined the movie. It really did, because I, I would. It, it's so good. It is so... It's genius. It's genius up to that point where you finally just figure out, you know, it's just going to keep having loud shit jump out at me. And you're like, it, it took me out of the movie. Now, if it doesn't bother you that much, you're going to love this movie. You're going to love it a lot. Um, it bothers me. And I've, I've often found that uh, uh, even the people in Paranormal Activity 4, it was honestly about... Uh, Nine-tenths of the people didn't like it. I, in fact, heard a lot of muttering as they were like, oh, that was fucking stupid. Um, and a lot of people go see Paranormal Activity. They're pretty easy marks, like me. Um, One-tenth, I would say, of the people were, like, really behind it. They're like, that was fucking scary. Oh, my God. that was... And I'm like, no, it wasn't scary. It was startling. And that's not the same thing. Um, I could name dozens of movies that do, that build atmosphere that build paranoia that build uh that build that tension that fright that feeling of powerlessness that you don't get from jump scares um and there's a different kind of there's a different kind of horror that is evoked that's not startling um there's there's gore or torture and that's why I don't like torture porn. It's why I don't like Saw. It's why I don't like Hostel. I don't like any movie that involves a gratuitous amount of torture because that is not horror either. What it is, is it's gore and it's pain. And the reason it's not horror is because it's disgust. It's, it's revulsion. It's stomach churning, just... It's, it's nastiness. It's, it's, again, it's not something you earn. It's just pain and that it's it's scary the threat of pain is scary but when you push it too far you're just showing people disgusting things that's not scary that's why saw is not scary it may be why the first movie was a little bit scary or why it kind of built this atmosphere where you're like this guy's fucking disgusting if you get caught man you're gonna die and you're gonna die slow and you're, you're gonna die horribly and even if you get out you're horribly irreparably disfigured you know that's that's fucking scary. But then, it really wasn't even about that anymore. It was just about murdering people in slow, gory ways. Now, gore has its place. In fact, one of my favorite horror directors is John Carpenter. And one of his goriest movies is The Thing. There's a lot of gore in The Thing. But, it's 
it's an alien horror. It's the gore is the means to an end where it it is this thing that masquerades as you so you never know who it is. You know, that's the paranoia, that's the tension. And when discovered, it becomes this gory, alien, slimy beast that it, it's almost like it's it's the fear of death. It's not it's not there's disgust involved, but it's that kind of disgust that an alien creature and you might argue that's the same thing it's not um prince of darkness john carpenter's prince of darkness it's one of the it's it has its flaws but there's some of the scariest shit i've ever seen in a horror movie takes place in that and it's i'm not going to spoil it but there's this dream that the characters keep having of this weird church and this woman's coming out of a church and there's this weird voice that's talking and it's you can't quite hear it you hear you get bits and pieces and it's this weird it's out of place and you're like what the fuck is that and you're listening real close and a lesser movie when you're listening real close orchestra sting this movie doesn't do that it it lets it play to its conclusion and then it stops and there's silence. Beautiful. It's beautiful how well that's executed. Um, there's there's uh, the Pang Brothers movie, The Eye. It has jump scares, but it only has like two. Okay, and those are scared. Uh, those are are earned, and you're always afraid of the next. You're afraid there's going to be another one, but it's not because it's startling. It's it's because when they jump out, the few times the the ghosts or the creatures, the few times they jump out, it's because they are fucking pissed. They are going to fuck you up. And so the scariest moments in that movie are the quiet ones because you're afraid at any point it's going to get real. Like there's this... Scene in the, the, a lot of people remember this scene in an elevator where she's she's trying to escape these ghosts and she's like trying to get back to her apartment. She's, like, she's hammering the button and there's this really long elevator ride and the elevator is going up and up and up and it's dead silent and all of a sudden she senses like she doesn't know but there's this ghost back there and she's like I can't turn around. She if she turns around she's gonna see it and if she sees it the ghost is gonna know she sees it. And then she's fucked. So you see this ghost, and it's you see it's floating. Like you see it's like floating like six inches over the ground, so it's not making any footfalls, and it's floating. It's coming up over here. And it like it's right here, like right in her peripheral vision, and she sees it, but she can't if she even turns her eyes. It's it's all you know, it's it so she's like it's so fucking scary so fucking scary um the there's a movie called audition and i do not want to spoil audition for you i won't go watch the movie audition it's by takashi miike um i would almost say i don't want to spoil it for you and you shouldn't spoil it for yourself i would honestly suggest if you're gonna watch audition have someone else okay i'll just the cover of the movie spoils too much in fact i've already told you too much i've told you it's a horror movie i've already said too much and i'm sorry don't look at the cover don't look at the disc i don't know how you're going to watch this movie have someone else get the movie have someone else bring it to your house, and without you seeing the cover, or the DVD menu, or whatever, have that person put the disc in, play the movie, call you in, and then watch the movie. Damn, I've already said too much by telling you about this movie. But, it's one of the best horror movies I've ever, ever seen. I don't know how you're going to watch it. Because if you're following my advice, if you're following my advice, like you've got to be blindfolded or something to, <laughs> to have someone else, have someone else rent it or uh, get it. Oh, I know, get it on like Netflix or something, and then have someone else get it on Netflix for you. Then put the disc in, then play the yeah. 
I don't know. Figure out how to do it without looking at it. Like the only way, the only time you should look at it is when the movie is well and truly started playing. It's so good, and it it, it may go against something I just said about. I, I won't even say it may go against. It, you may think it does, but it earns it. Okay, it definitely it it. So good, so fucking good, Cronenberg. Now, you could easily argue a lot of what Cronenberg does is not technically horror. It's maybe suspense or uh, sci-fi. But it's called... I've heard it called body horror. Where um, something is happening to your body. That your, your body is out of control. And I know that sounds weird. Like, you don't quite understand what I'm saying if you've never seen one. But, like, if you saw something happening to your body something really fucking weird. Like, all of a sudden, your hands started getting gnarled, and, like, like, claws started coming out of your fucking hand. But, like, sometimes they disappear, and sometimes they're there. And, like, you don't know if you're going insane, and you don't know if you should tell people. And, you like, you don't know. Like, and it, it hurts, and you think something is happening to you. But, like, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but... Um, Cronenberg does so many great movies like that. Um, Shivers, which is one of the most, uh, it's, it's probably, I hate the word most unique cause that doesn't make any sense, but it's probably one of the most out there, uh, takes on the zombie genre I've ever seen. I've never seen a zombie genre go this way. And I don't want to say, I won't say any more than that, but Shivers, hard to find, worth it. Um, The Brood, I actually did not like The Brood, but it's still worth watching. Because it's, it, it, I didn't like the brute that much, but it's still worth watching, you know what I mean? Um, Scanners, uh, what the, I know, I'm thinking of some other ones. Um, oh, God. How am I blanking on these? I don't know. Look for Cronenberg Harmon. Oh, uh, Videodrome. Videodrome is fucking awesome. And again, you could argue that's not really horror, but it's so, it is scary, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, so good. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other directors. Um, this one may not be all, for all of you. Uh, yeah, the eye. Um, there's uh, uh, there's a movie called Pulse. Um, do not watch the American version of the eye. It sucks. Uh, do not watch the American version of Pulse because it it takes everything that was good about Pulse and fucks it up. It is honestly, if you're talking betrayal, the American version of Pulse literally betrays every single thing that was good and scary. It, it just totally, it, I don't know if it betrays it or just completely misunderstands what made Pulse good. It's called Pulse or Cairo. K-A-I-R-O. Um, another good one, um, this will sound really silly, One Missed Call. Again, by uh, Takashi Miike. Um, I will explain it because it's fairly obvious from the title. You know how a lot of movies kind of do this uh, demonic, like uh, virtually every household appliance has been done. Like there's a possessed X, you know, deathbed, the bed that eats, or the killer fridge, or what is it, the mangler that's like a possessed washing machine or something like that, the possessed elevator, the, uh, you know, everything has been done. Um, except there's one missed call, which again, watch the Japanese or do not watch the American version. And I know this makes me seem like a Japanophile. Um, it's not that it's just that the American versions are such bad spins on the Japanese versions. Uh, the grudge, I don't even like the Japanese version, but the American version is horrible. Um, the only good American adaptation of a Japanese horror movie that I've ever seen, and again, this will probably get me flamed, is The Ring. Um, I am actually not that big a fan of uh, Ring, uh, the uh, the Japanese version. It's, called, it's spelled Ringu, but uh, not a fan of that. It's it's scary, but I think that the, the higher production values of the American version are actually very good. I, I think it makes the scary video a lot scarier, and I like that. The, the scary video should be legitimately unsettling, and I don't think it was that scary in the Japanese, or at least I saw the Japanese version second, but yeah. It's better. I, I think the American one is better. Um, the, uh, yeah, One Missed Call is a haunted cell phone. 
I know. Okay. I know you're rolling your eyes right now and you're like, what? A cell phone? Yes. Okay. Bear with me. It's good. It is so good because it's not really the cell phone. Okay. And again, this is not big spoilers because the first question you ask to anyone sane would ask is, okay, your cell phone is haunted. You think it is. You know, people are dying and it's because of like the fucking cell phone. Your first question is, throw the cell phone away, right? They do. They throw the cell phone away. It doesn't help. And it's not that the cell phone like comes back, like it follows them on little feet. No, it's not that because it's not really the phone. Okay. Um, And in fact, it's so good because you know how in movies like Sinister, you always ask, like, well, why don't they just call the cops? Why don't they just leave? Why don't they tell their friends? Why don't they call the news? Like, if something clearly scared, and they got it on tape, something scary's going on, something clearly supernatural, why don't they call the news, get this on YouTube, get this so everyone fucking sees it? So why don't they, why do they spend all their time alone? If something's going to get them when they're alone, why don't they all sit in a group? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, if there's a ghost that only gets you when they're alone, which is oftentimes a big problem for any haunted, you know, like, ghost that kills you movie. Like, the ghost always, like, Juwan, the grudge. Um, the ghost only gets people that, who, they, for some reason, they always go in the fucking house alone. Or they split up, and they get picked off. No. One missed call. You, you ask all these questions, okay? Why do they go off alone? Why don't they call the cops? Why don't they call the news? All these questions. Why don't they get rid of the phone? Why don't they change the number? All of these questions... They do. You know, they, they do everything a sane person in that situation with time to think would do. It's brilliant, okay? It's so good that it, it not only doesn't insult your intelligence, it takes everything the audience might think, has them do it, and sees if it works, right? So, like, they, uh... <clears throat> they call the cops, and there's people dying. There's there's dead people, and they're like, they they go to the cops, they show them footage, and they're like, you gotta protect us. We can't explain this, but please, would you like just for the night? Like our time is up. Something is gonna get us. We don't know if it's supernatural, but we've been targeted. Would you please watch us? And the cops go, okay. And sure enough, the cops watch them. And then when, pe- when more people start dying, the news gets involved. The news reporters are like, oh my God, you're the, you're the guys who are being, like, you're connected to the whole phone murders thing, right? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, tell you what, if, if it only gets you when you're alone or whatever, we will watch you, okay? We will, we, we have security. We will, all we ask is like, we'll, we'll put cameras on you. If there's anything that happens to you, we will document it. But it won't happen because there will be people watching you. Nobody will get in or out. We have, like, fucking commandos. Like, sur- sur- nothing will get in, okay? And so, like, in fact, not only that, we've got, like, priests. We've got exorcists. We'll have, like, these people believe you. They will be shrining the entire place. You know, um, it's mainly, like, a Shinto dude who's, who's doing this. But, like, you will be surrounded at all times by people. Nothing will get you. So, like, they're like, okay. It's, it's a good idea, right? And so, some things work, some things don't, right? So, honestly, that is not spoilers, because I, I'm telling you, this is one of the smartest. And, and even if I describe the premise with the possessed cell phone thing, you're like, oh, please. No. It's such a good, smart movie, and it's still so scary. It It's beautiful. Um... I could go on all night. I'll just say one more. This is another Japanese film. Um, I sound like such a weeaboo at this point. I could think of a bunch of horror movies. Uh, I, honestly, the best horror movies I've seen are are typically Cronenberg and John Carpenter. Uh, if I were to come up with a few more, I probably could. Um, uh, Sam Raimi's early work, I really like. I like Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. I honestly think he... I, I actually am not a huge fan of Army of Darkness. I mean, I'm a fan of it as a comedy, but as an Evil Dead sequel, it's a betrayal. Um, 
Yeah, John Carpenter, he calls it the Apocalypse Trilogy, which is Prince of Darkness, In the Mouth of Madness, and The Thing. Uh, all three very good. In fact, In the Mouth of Madness, if you're looking for a Cthulhu horror film, it's that. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the better uh, Cthulhu mythos type movies. Um, I could come up, uh, Dario Argento, he's not American, but you know that's one of the more Western style. Um, all very good stuff. You know, Suspiria, that sort of thing. That's that's kind of jump scary, but still, Suspiria's good. Uh, yeah, I, I could probably go on. I could, uh, shit, I could make a list. That'd probably be a video all on its own. Um, but the last one I'll go on about, and this may break my rule of... I don't think it's jump scares, but it's definitely gory. Is uh, It's a Japanese movie called Infection. And it's about... Uh, it's about this hospital that's about to close... And suddenly they get a very sick man who's who's ambulanced into the into the hospital, and there's something really wrong with him. And it may not be just like a normal infection. In fact, it's probably something else. And so it's a very gory movie, but it's also very psychological. And actually, it's scary in a lot of different ways because there was stuff happening in that film that I actually went on Twitter, and I asked, like, would this really happen? I'll just tell you. Not a big spoiler. Um, some of the people in the hospital start going crazy, and it might be because of the infection. It might be because something supernatural is going on. And so one of the characters is this nurse. And sometimes when it comes to health care, you get good nurses and you get bad nurses. You get good doctors and bad. Some health care people really struggle with certain aspects of health care. For instance... Uh, if you've ever given blood or you've had blood taken from you for a test, I'm sure some of you, almost everyone probably has had an occurrence where the, the lab tech fucked up. They either, they either put like, they either stuck you through your vein and they didn't get the right vein or they fucked up and you started bleeding, you know, something like that. Sometimes they miss the vein completely. Something like it's, it's, some of you are like really cringing right now just thinking about it. But, um, that's why a lot of people don't like to have blood drawn or shots, you know, like, it's stuff like that. And so some nurses really have a problem with it. And so sometimes they got to really practice it. And so there's this character who's a nurse who kind of has a problem, you know, taking IVs and stuff like that. Cause it's difficult. You know, it's, it's being any kind of nurse or doctor. It's, that's why they go to school for years and that's why they have so much practice, but it's hard. So there's this nurse who is, they, they practice sometimes on like not cadavers, but uh, they do practice on cadavers, but like, they practice doing stitches on sides of, uh, like, uh, like pigs, or like sides of beef. They'll practice sutures because it's, like, it's skin, you know. So she's practicing her sutures because they're, you, can, you, you need to do them very well when you're treating injured people. So she's practicing sutures. She's practicing, you know, IVs. And so there comes this time when she starts to go nuts because she might have been infected that she comes out of this... She comes out of the like the nurses station, and she's kind of got these crazy eyes. And the uh, the one of the doctors is like, "Are you okay?" And she's like, "I'm so much better now. I finally figured out how to put an IV in." And you see, like she's got like the most horrible fucking track marks all over her fucking arms, like all over. And she's like, "I finally practiced and I did it." And I'm like. Oh my god! It's so horrible. Like, and I'm like, it's horrible in that good way where you're like, oh shit, she's fucking out there. And so, I actually I asked. I was on Twitter and I was like, um. So there's this character who's who's like really bad, like abysmally fucking Gomer Pyle bad, like retarded at at putting IVs in and sutures. And I'm like, there's no way anyone gets out of like med school who's that bad right and i i get a bunch of responses on twitter that were just like dot 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 and i'm like no and i'm like no R no and the, like there was a few people who work as Healthcare, paramedics, doctors, whatever. And so I, I, I directly messaged them. And I'm like, you're fucking with me, right? And they're like, dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. No. And they're like, yeah. And, I'm like, and they're like, we can't say anything, but yeah. And I'm like, 
oh, oh my god, that was scarier than anything in the movie that, like, <laughs> like, I guess every doctor has a story about dumb, some dumb fucking intern, or, like, a nurse who is just, like, a complete idiot. I'm like, don't tell me that. Don't fucking tell me that. No! I feel like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm like, no. Anyway, I've gone too far afield. Um, final verdict on Paranormal Activity 4. Shit movie. Absolute shit movie. Even if you're a fan... You're probably so invested, you gotta see it. I'm telling you, no. And it's not even, it's, it's seriously not even worth watching if you're a fan. Because like I said, they take the story and they punt. They do nothing with the story. It doesn't progress one iota. Not one. Because it's essentially a remake of two, where they get, there's a kid in the house and the demon wants the kid. Punt. That's the only way I can describe it. They have nowhere to go, so they just kick off, hoping that hoping that in five they'll have some original ideas. Not looking forward to it. Sinister? I would recommend you go see it. It irritated the shit out of me, but it's good enough that I think someone who doesn't nitpick nearly as much as I do will really, really enjoy it. I haven't seen... I, I always say this. I've never... I, I don't watch Cinema Snobs uh, reviews until I see the movie myself. I'm guessing he thought Paranormal 4 was dog shit, and I'm also guessing he really liked Sinister. I don't grudge him that, and I'm not saying he's stupid. Uh, I've only called Snob out a couple times. I honestly can see clearly why people love this movie. Not my style. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I mean, seriously, it's amazing how similar Brad and I are, and yet our tastes in movies are so radically different. I, I think our tastes in bad movies are... are like, right in, right in line, but our taste in good movies are... I think I'm much harder to please than Brad is. Again, not insulting the guy. I think I envy... A lot of ways I envy people who... I'm hardwired to nitpick. Um, I can't let it go. So, pity me. Pray for my soul. So, uh, yeah. That's all I got. How long have I rambled? I don't know. I'm going to split this movie up, though. So, enjoy. Have a good one.